right, well, let's get started together. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Welcome to you in Jesus' name. It's time change happened overnight, and so may have gotten a hold of you, maybe not, but it is a little different. Again, we'll get used to it, I'm sure, eventually. But we did get where we missed out last week, so thank you for being able to be back today and being able to get back in the routine again. And we wanted to be able to, you can see the yellow sheet that's in your bulletin. That's uh, updated stuff. So otherwise, the bulletin, we want to use the same one we were going to last week because it's a very special Sunday last week, the celebrating the Reformation, the time when Martin Luther posted the 95 Theses on the church door in Wittenberg saying, I got questions about what authority the Bible has compared to what the church says. I think we should be about the Bible's authority. And that desire just to talk about it in the church ended up beginning the Reformation of the church to the Protestant Reformation. We protest what that stood for. We protest that there are some things that are not matching what the Bible says that we are doing right now in the church. That's how we eventually had the Protestant churches, as they said, thus says the Lord in the Bible. So we celebrate that. We are the first, quote-unquote, Protestant church as those who, like Luther, who saw the Bible and said, yeah, that's what the Lord says. What his word is, that's the authority. And we celebrate that still today. There's a lot of people today that says, don't listen to what the Bible says. Just do your own thing, and spiritually it'll be fine. As much as that's easy, because you don't have to argue about it with anybody, it's not the truth. So we're going to celebrate the gift of God's word together today. So this has the updated information in it. This is the bulletin, though, for the service that we use for today from last week. And just a reminder in the yellow sheets here real quick that we've got on the back side of their request, because we had the system go out on us last week, last minute, and weren't able to have worship, try to get word out as best we could. We know we probably didn't get a hold of everybody. We do have a congregational-wide email system to send out that we did use. If you got that, awesome. Just know if any any question about anything, do please check your emails if you're on that list. Some people have email, but they have not gotten where we have your information yet. So if you would, if we could go ahead and send an email out to you if something's going on. Then we got the table back in the narthex there. It's got a place to write that information down. Some say I don't get email but maybe you are able to receive texts. So if you, you say, yeah, I would let, rather receive a text, that'd be better for me. And if you would, please give us your information for that. And others don't have either one. They don't, they don't have a lot of that stuff and just use a telephone. So if that's the case for you, if you wouldn't mind giving us what number you'd want us to call you with, with that kind of information, and we can get that set up with those who will help, okay? So next couple of three weeks, if you would, please help us with that. That's one thing. The other thing, Victor's here, and he's got an announcement about what's coming up this next week, so I'll go ahead. Oh, we still, what an unlucky day, huh? We don't, Zen is out of town, seeing the kids this weekend for a birthday down in Little Rock, so I'll be the only one doing music today, unless you want to help me, but we don't have the, we don't have the speaker out for her, or the microphone for her today that we otherwise would have ready for you to be able to talk with, so okay. we still don't have a mic okay. for you, so. I just want to uh, encourage you Check your mailbox because the newsletter is in there and also the reports of all the teams that we have here at Peace because then you can read it beforehand and you'll be well informed for the voters meeting next Sunday. Okay? So we encourage you to do that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Victor. So, so next week, again, one service together, all 11, 15, 12, 30 for the potluck together and then the service or the a voters meeting will be at 1.30. And, and if you see in the announcement there, it'll be, Victor, what do we say? The, the Victor? Oh, I missed him. We're going to tease him a little bit. Last year, we had the meeting, and it was a little over three hours long. So this year, would you all come for five hours? Would that be okay? What's that? You're not coming? Yeah. And yeah, we, we, we heard from Sarah, which is good, that that was kind of long to try to sit through and, and make use of. So... We're going to make every effort to have it be done in 90 minutes or less. Okay, so that's the uh, pledge we're working on. And one of the reasons that we have the, those printed out reports written ahead of time. So if you can, grab those and read them this week so that when you come next week, you're already informed with that. And you can ask questions if you have them. 
but at least they'll they'll help that be less of a three hour meeting and more of an hour and a half or less. So a couple things to let you know then. So let's go ahead then and begin our worship with that response read from Psalm one eighteen, recognizing today is another day. God gave us an extra hour on top of it being another day. So why don't we rejoice then here where it says, This is the day the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. So let's begin then in the name of our Lord that we are here to praise together, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, we're going to start off then with worshiping our Lord with that song called Famous For, as we know about his deeds because the word of the Lord has been given to us in our times and we rejoice in those truths. So let's sing Famous For. I believe there is no doubt cause I have seen your faithfulness my fortress over and over I have a hope found in your name I have a strength found in your grace Faithfulness, my fortress, over and over. Make way through the waters, walk me through the fire. Do what you are famous for, what you are famous for. Shut the mouths of lions, bring dry bones to life. Do what you are famous for. Wash you are famous for I believe in, in you God, I believe in, in you Release your love inside of me Unleash your power for all to see Spirit come and fall on us and over, oh Make way through the waters, walk me through the fire. Do what you are famous for, what you are famous for. Shut the mouths of lions, bring dry bones to life. And do what you are famous for, what you are famous for. God of God of abundantly, more than we ask or think, Lord, you will never fail. Your name is powerful, your word's unstoppable, all things are possible in you. God of exceedingly, God of abundantly. What you are famous for Shut the mouths of lions Bring dry bones to life And do what you are famous for What you are famous for I our faithful God that takes care of us just as he did for the previous generations of Christians, just as he'll do for the ones coming yet to come. We all need that and that's why let's stand 
And we'll sing our second song together today called Hold On To Me, saying, Lord, I believe you. You're famous for doing the things that you said, having the power and the will to help us. And that's what I need too. So let's, in that faith, that humble faith, ask him to care for us, for our needs for today and tomorrow and for each other to do that for us as well as God's people. So let's sing Hold On To Me. When the best of me is barely breathing When I'm not somebody I believe in Hold on to me When I miss the light, the night is stolen When I'm slamming all the doors you've opened Hold on to me Hold on to me Hold on to me when it's too dark to see you When I am sure I have reached the end Hold on to me when I forget open to us 24 7 and does care about us and provides for our needs not only providing for us the good things that we need and ask for in jesus name but also providing for us the punishment for our sins as he has paid for that on the cross and gives us that forgiveness that we don't earn don't deserve but we rejoice in and say lord i take you at your promise to ask for that forgiveness in the name of jesus and he has given it to us in that faith. So let's take him up on that together again today as we join, join together in speaking the back to God closer prayer. Heavenly Father, we know that we are sinners. Each of us has sinned and has fallen short of your glory. We have broken your commandments, often doing what you hate and refusing to do what you desire. Our faith in you is shaken and fractured by the times we refuse to listen closely to you and by the many false spiritual teachings that bombard us every day. Forgive us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. We know his blood was shed to deliver us, and we trust in him alone as we stand before you. Reform us as your holy people. Teach us again the joy of our salvation and grant us willing spirits to follow you faithfully. Help us to value your holy word and make use of it faithfully. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
I'm going to take God's word too hard. One word today, and that is that word Jesus said on the cross, tetelestai, the word in the Hebrew that says, it is finished, being able to know that God has paid in full, the stamp saying, your sin's debt has been forgiven by me as I have died on the cross to pay for you, and I give that to you as my free gift. This was at the core of so much of the Reformation is that people were being told, you got to earn your way into heaven. you got to earn your way into God's good favor. you got to do these sacrifices and make these various uh, ways that you prove that you're worthy of getting the mercy. And the Bible says no. The Bible says you're only saved because of what Christ has done for you. And that's the essence that we are so thankful for. We never have to say... I had a neighbor many years back that used to say, you know, I wonder sometimes if I've done enough that I'll be in heaven when I die. He literally asked that a lot, he said. Do you have to ask that? I wonder if I've done enough to be in heaven one day. If it depended on your gifts that you give to God, if it depended on your acts that earned your favor and kind of paid off your debt, yeah, you better worry about it. But that's not how it works. Jesus says, I have paid that sin for you from first to last. And that's why you and I have the humble confidence as we say, Lord, forgive me for Jesus' name. And he says, I do. You are mine washed clean. So in that joy of forgiveness and life that comes with it, have a seat then. And let's continue to worship the Lord rightly and to thank him for being our God and letting us be his people. And be then as we're in the word and prayer time together cause he has given us that privilege in Jesus name to do so <clears throat> excuse me let's take a look at the first part here of, of uh, oh wait, 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 wait. that's right this being a special celebration Sunday with the Reformation Day we do have today at the bottom there of your left side page in your bulletin the portion of Psalm 46 that was one of the famous and favorite Psalms that Martin Luther held to with so much topsy-turvy people after him, trying to kill him and different things and making terrible comments about him all the time for what he was trying to do, pointing people to God's word alone and to be able to have that comfort he needed to know God's going to be with me and help me in the midst of all the storms of life that go on. Come forward to 2023, 2024, 2029, however long we're here, we're going to have storms and all kinds of struggles to deal with in our lives, too. It's just life, this side of heaven. And so this is a reminder to us, as to all generations, of the gift of God's strong and merciful presence in us and through us. And so let's join in speaking these words from Psalm 46 together. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. That's why we thank God that he is all-powerful and all in charge. And we're good with that. We don't want to tell him, no, I'll do it, Lord. You leave me alone. I'd rather say, thank you, God. You're with me. I'm always going to need you. Now, let's take a look at God's Word, the first part here. This is from John chapter 8. We're going to look at this morning, verses 31 through 36, page 1663. In your pew Bibles, if you want to look along with me there. This is where Jesus is talking about the blessing of being in God's Word, what it says, and holding to it. In other words, saying, I know it, and I trust it, and believe it. This is what I'm going to follow with God's help. The gift of being free from sin. There's free from sin, and that means free from death, free from hell, being able to be God's people headed for heaven. So Jesus says here in chapter John eight, chapter eight, starting at verse thirty one, says to the Jews who believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, 
but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And that's how far we get in the first part of experiencing God in his word. All right, let's take a look then at our song we'll sing today, fitting for Reformation Day, and that is Mighty Fortress. So let's sing Mighty Fortress together.
This is our offering. Let all your people sing. A mighty fortress is our God. This is our offering. Let all your people sing. A mighty fortress is our God. This is our offering. It's so true, isn't it? The calm that can come into our lives because we know that He is our mighty God. So we got a lot to enjoy being able to celebrate that together today. Let's take a look at the second part of experiencing God in His Word in Daniel chapter 2. We haven't looked at this part for a long time together in the scriptures here in worship. It's very fitting for today. Daniel chapter 2. Verse 36 and following, it starts on page 1373, then in the Pew Bibles, or if you've got your own Bible, always good to bring that, mark it up as we look at it and go through it, as it's your toolbox, it's your, your, your war chest of what God has said to put to use. So don't be afraid to get that Bible marked up and have it be something that is a place where you're doing that growing in the Word and being able to absorb it and have it ready to share with others as well. So we're going to be looking at this whole idea of calm in the storm, strength and truth within so much pulling at us, many variations of what is out there. And what do we do? What do we believe? What do we, what do we handle when life keeps getting thrown at us? Constant change. Well, I was confronted with this, such a reality check for me, probably about three or four weeks ago, I think it was now, saw where someone had passed away and was talking with the family. I was looking at the obituary. I thought, wow, that was really written very well, very, very uh, fluid. A lot of what they call the $10 words, like unwavering devotion, those kind of things, you know. And it was very impressive the way it was written. And when I was talking with some of the family, I said, you guys did a good job with that. He said, well, we didn't do that. What? He said, we just told them a few things about the person. And they said, okay, we'll start working with this. And next thing we see when it comes out, it's like, wow, that is really good. We didn't write that. They're all like saying, I didn't know that. I thought, because I've done enough, you know, with parents passing away and stuff, written the obituary. I thought, surely they write it. But I started to think, I went back and looked at it again. You know those $10 words, $20 words, $50 words they use? It was so perfect, so flowing, so masterful, like a movie almost would be of that person's life. I thought, I bet you diamond of donuts that the company that they had to, to, to prepare the remains and help them with the obituary has probably got one of these new artificial intelligence think bots that they plugged in the basic information. This is what the person's relatives were. This is what they did for their hobbies. This is when they were born and died. And that think bot probably has been told how to formulate these beautiful $20 word obituaries. It was perfect. It was perfect. It was too perfect. It had lost a sense of, I would say, human reality. Isn't that weird? I just thought, oh my word. Okay. I hear that they say that there are sermons being written and preached and preached by AI now. So if I'm not hearing as a robot up here next week, you'll know that somebody decided to try that out. Who knows, you know? That's what, just one of so many things unknown in our lives. It's like, okay, one more thing. How are we going to deal with that as more stuff comes at us? How much of it's going to really help us? And how much of it's going to end up being used as a way to further take away from us in some way? And it's just, ugh. Sometimes change can drive a person crazy, can't it? They, they say it, one of the reasons we struggle so much with such a sense of constantly being on the defensive from stuff is in the last hundred years of history, more has changed in life and the way things work in 100 years compared to all, all of history back to the beginning of time. That's a lot of change, isn't it? Packed into one little segment compared to thousands of years. So it's not surprising and that, that happened up to now. Can you imagine another hundred years if this keeps going this way? We may have a very, very different world that our great grandkids perhaps are going to be trying to figure out what to do with. So 
So in the midst of that change comes a lot of uncertainty of all generations. They were struggling with it here in the time of the book of Daniel as well. I'm going to take a look at how God addresses the, the changes that were constantly happening in their lives that God helped them to be prepared for, and the same for us today as we deal with changes, many of which may be good, helpful, but many of which are going to be hard or difficult to struggle with, and so let's ask God as he helps us through his word and to deal with that. How do we take on change, a constantly changing world, with the changeless God that we worship? So to get a little background in this chapter 2 of Daniel, Daniel was one of God's prophets during the time of the fall of Israel into the exile into Babylon. No surprise there, God told him again and again and again and again and again. Be faithful to me, walk with me. And I'll give you the promised land. I'll give you land flowing with milk and honey. I'll give you peace, prosperity. It'll be great. If you spit in my eye and you chase after the pagan nations and you ignore the things I've said in my word to you, then I will eventually, if you continue to not repent, I will humiliate you by sending you out of this land I gave you into exile in Babylon for 70 years. And you will learn then what it is to be without my grace and favor until I bring you back again. And so this is what happened. That they, they tested him over and over and over again. And God says, I'm not to be played as a fool. So he did as he said. And so here we find now Daniel with the people that were exiled into Babylon. And now the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, says, I've got a problem and you've got to solve it. He had this strange dream about this giant statue. And he didn't know what it meant. So he said, I need answers. And he said, all right, you all who are my wise men and my advisors, I need just two things from you, that's all. One, I need you to tell me what my dream was. And two, you need to tell me what it meant. Go. If you had a stopwatch, you'd probably click it. But probably just waved a stick or something and said, go. you got only so long before I will kill you if you don't give me the answers. Now, Daniel was considered one of his advisors by force because he was wise, recognized already as someone who would be good to take advice from. So he and the people that were in exile were considered as a part of those the, the wisdom sages. They were also on the line. And so the Lord then, as God does, provided that answer, what the king dreamed and what did it mean. And that's what we see in this chapter too. So when we see the... the information just briefly we go back if you look with me back there at chapter 2 verse 32 this is basically where daniel is telling him this is what you saw in your dream it was a big statue it had a head that was a statue of made of pure gold then the next part of this big statue had a chest it was made out of silver and arms its belly was made out of bronze different metal again its legs were made of iron and his feet were part iron and part clay, a mix of metal and dirt. Isn't that strange? And then there's this huge rock that comes and tumbles down out of a mountain, crushes the whole thing. Okay, what does that mean? That's a fair question, isn't it? Because it's kind of a weird dream, isn't it? And so here then God provides to Daniel, as God being the one who knows all things, provides what this dream was all about. And that's what we're taking a look at there together in verse 36. So this is where now Daniel is speaking to King Nebuchadnezzar and to those listening. It says, this was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. You, O king, are the king of kings, the God of heaven, has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. So he says, you're part of this dream in your power and position in charge of the Babylonian Empire. But he says, basically, get ready for change. And this is what we'll see of the messages here, saying that change is coming. Change is coming not only for Nebuchadnezzar, but really for everybody. And you think about us today, there's... Constantly, how many times we get words saying, okay, now the economy's gone this way or that way. Now it's smart to get this stock versus that stock. Or buy gold instead of buying uh, digital money. That kind of, you know, all those kind of things back and forth. Some 
I remember back living in Nebraska, they talked a lot about the futures for farming, that you would buy grain, etc., based on what they hoped and thought maybe would happen with crops way down the road. And that was the way, if you guessed wise enough, you'd make all kind of money. If you blew it, well, you might go bankrupt, but better luck next time. But it was all about trying to figure out what's coming and changing from what right, right now is and being ready for it. And we always are confronted with that, don't we? Change is coming. We know that much. What's it going to be for good or for bad? How is it going to be different? We can guess and try and take a stab at it, but we don't know. God does, but we don't know. But it makes us very vulnerable feeling when we think, I just, it's just something as simple as you get your computer and you figure out which working system it's on, how to run it, and then they come out with a new one and say, now you've got to use a new working system. It's like, oh, anybody besides me have trouble with that? So change can be very frustrating sometimes, can't it? Sometimes it is good, it's an improvement, and sometimes it can be a disaster. We have people that we depend on, and we thought were going to be there for us, and then they're not. We have ways that we make a living, and then suddenly it's changed, and that's not needed anymore, and then we're out of a job. We have strong, healthy running, doing marathons, and then we find out we've got a disease, and we can't run or even walk. And things like that happen, don't they? It's a part of life, and it makes us feel very vulnerable. So God's message in this dream is helpful for us in our times, just as it was for these guys when they heard it long ago, and the changing that was going to happen to them. So we've got then the current was that we've got where Nebuchadnezzar was the king of the kingdom of Babylon, but the Lord then goes on and says it's not going to stay that way. <clears throat> Excuse me. So He says, "Let me find where I'm at here." Da -da -da. Got to turn it back over here. Okay, so then he goes on, he just continues to say what's happening. He says, after you, another kingdom will rise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth, a kingdom strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything, and as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and the toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. And as the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. This is a fascinating future picture that God gave in this dream to Nebuchadnezzar, saying, you're going to be the one right now, but you're not going to last. After you're going to come another kingdom. This happened in 539. The Persian Empire emerged and took over the Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian kingdom. And then Alexander the Great, when the Greeks came and took over in 330. And then you get into the Romans that take over next after the Greeks. And then Rome was such a big spread out empire that it was kind of schismed around and didn't really connect and have the same strength as the earlier state ones did. That's where they went from the gold, the fine metals, but not as strong, down to the iron. And then it started to fade into kind of a brittle iron and mix of clay saying the kingdoms as time goes on will have less power in the dictators though they'll be longer and bigger as time goes on. That all was fulfilled as God said it would be. But that's not the end. In the midst of all that change the constant differences of all these different parts of the statue the last part then God gives in his dream can, brings a whole different perspective. So as he's talking about this statue, then in verse 44 he says, In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, 
and the gold to pieces. And who was that? Do you remember? That came at the time when the Roman Empire was in charge of the world. That came a rock hewn out of the mountain. Someone that is, in fact, God Almighty, owning all the universe, who came in the flesh as a human being down from heaven where he could just stay cushy, comfortable, down into this world to live with us, to be with us, to be us in every way except what? Except without sin. And to be willing then to, to change his perfection on the cross for our sin and to suffer our eternity's worth of punishment in hell in order that we don't have to pay that price for those who believe in him. This is Jesus, of course, who comes in, owns all things. People who beforehand said, no, I'm in charge. I'm the one that rules the world. God says, no, you think so, but I'm the one that owns all things. And Jesus comes and establishes a kingdom that lasts. Our, our being in the kingdom of God is not something of this world that we say, I'm a Christian so I can get economic advantages. I'm a Christian so I can have people like me more. I'm a Christian so that I will get where God will give me a nice, comfortable life here and everything will go smooth and easy for me. How's that working for you? Have you had a smooth and easy life because you're a Christian? It's not so easy to have, is it? In fact, it's hard in the world sometimes. Being as a Christian, we will be persecuted more, the Lord says. So our kingdom as Christ's own is not all about being here and establishing more power to push people around somehow. But rather know that <clears throat> Jesus, who has come, is the ruler of the kingdom of God, and he is the one that is our king. And that's not going to change. That's going to be something you can count on that will endure ongoing. See, and that truth that God has revealed and proven to us over the ages is what gives that strength to that Psalm 46 that we looked at there. If you want to look back in your bulletin with me, the portion of Psalm 46, just look at the power of that that God gives us. God is our refuge and our strength, and ever-present help in <clears throat> trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth gives way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Because God is our strength and our fortress, therefore, we do not fear even though every crazy chaos is going on all around us. Have you ever had a crazy chaos day, crazy chaos year? It happens, doesn't it? Life can be very frustrating and challenging for us in this world, even as a Christian. In the midst of that, we can either freak out like people do naturally and have it be completely pull our heads apart as to what am I going to do with this? Or we can choose to remember God is my refuge. He is my strength. And therefore, only because he is God, he knows what he's doing. He is in charge. And we don't have to be afraid that others will overtake him. Therefore, we will not fear even though we've got chaos all around us. And this is where then the, the statement of the lasting truth that God's word gives to us is this. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And therefore, again, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. I am God. I am in control the rest of the people in this world do not control like they think they do. I am. And because you know that, because the Holy Spirit has brought you that faith through what the Bible has said, you're able to say, therefore, I can be still and know that he is God and I am his child. And that's a powerful gift he's given to you and to me in the times that we live in. It looks like to me 2024 is going to be one wild year probably with all the uncertainties everywhere it seems like in life and it's going to be very unnerving and we can let it stir us into a, a worked up frenzy of anxiety all the time and just waiting for the other shoe to drop somewhere around us or we can say, wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute God is still our refuge and our strength in 2024 just as he was last year just as he was 10 years ago just as he was back in the time of the funny statue dream in the time of Daniel. And he's going to be the constant, trustworthy, powerful, merciful God all the way through into eternity. Therefore, I'm going to be able to be still and know he is God. I'm going to be able 
to know I'm not going to be afraid. It's going to be His gift. His Spirit is going to create that. We don't just generate that ourselves. But that's one of those blessings of having the Word of God and being lifelong students of it. To be those who know from Psalm 119, it's got this beautiful couple of verses that talks about this. I saw it just recently here. Verse 89 and 90, Psalm 119 says, Your Word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. You establish the earth, and it endures. Now, God puts a big contrast between the steady, reliable, who he is, what he's done, how it's changed everything in the universe for us, and the world is constantly changing around. You can't always count on to be there and work well. And in fact, you can count it being a wild stir, just like the mountains being thrown into the heart of the sea. That's why Jesus talks about in Matthew 7. He says that you've got a couple choices here. He says there is either you can hear the word of the Lord and act on it because you believe it, then you will have like the house that's built on the rock and the wind, the storms, the rain will beat down and squall upon it, but that house will stand because it's on the rock. Or he said you can be like the world around you says, build on the sand, shiftable, build it wherever you want, easy to move around, make it something that's cheap and easy, and just say, this is great, I just got away with something. But then he says, what happens then if you say, I'm going to hear the word of the Lord and not listen to it, not put it into practice, it's going to be like building on sand, not if, but when. The storms and the turbulence of life hit and it crushes it to the ground. So we aren't people that are going to say, God, thank you that I don't need you. God, I have science. God, I have wise humanity. I don't need God anymore. I don't need the Bible. I can do it myself. Thank God that's not what we're saying. We know that that's just like building on sand and waiting for the storms to come and knock you down. Rather, we're saying, Lord, you're my fortress. You're my rock. You're my hope. You're who I trust. You're who gives me your word. I believe what you said by your spirit teaching me that. Help me to hold to that. Help me to keep telling myself, therefore, 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 I will not be afraid. Therefore, I will be at peace. Therefore, I will rejoice that you are my God. See me through life. Help me with the hard changes there are. And help me to help others as well. So thank you, God, for giving us your word, being our rock. And then we can share that with each other as God's people take that with us into the world we live in that needs to hear it now every bit as much as it did back in Daniel's day too. So to him be all glory and thanks and may that be something that we take to heart again this day and on forward in Jesus name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's come to our Lord in prayer together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father we do thank you for being our rock, being our fortress, being our strength, being he who has conquered all things that would oppose you, able and willing to be our Savior. Jesus, thank you for coming into this world as such and being that hewn out of the mountain of being God Almighty to be the limited in the flesh being that you chose to do to limit your power to even be able to be killed on the cross for our sins and then rise in full power again in glory and honor, having paid that price, going into heaven, preparing a place for us, <clears throat> promising you will come back and take us to be with you. Thank you for that. Remind us of that truth and all the truths in your word as we deal in the constant change and uncertainties of life that's thrown at us. We pray that you give us that peace even amongst the storms of our lives as we think right now about things in our life that have really stressed us or uncertainties that have caused us great pause. We bring them again to your throne of grace today in our hearts, asking for your special help and your peace and strength to deal with those things. We pray for those things in our hearts to you right now at this time. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we do pray for your healing and your help for all who are facing struggles and hardships in this life. Remind them of your promise to be with them and help them. Thank you for your word that we have to be able to read and study and continue to learn throughout our lives. Help us to be lifelong students of your word and to share that with other people in our lives as well. And bring them to saving faith that are not there now 
And we pray that you will strengthen those that are already fellow Christians in that faith you have blessed them with. Help our church family to stay strong in the Lord, keep growing in the Lord, and bring that blessing you've given to us to the world that we are called to minister to in this place and this time. We thank you, Lord, for the healing you continue to grant to Wayne Yonke as he recovers from his hip replacement surgery. We pray for your continued healing for him. Likewise, for Ruth Maxedon as she recovers further from her heart procedure. We pray, dear Lord, for your help. Again, with the war going on in the Middle East, that you would protect and help the innocent people in the line of fire. You will help and protect those who are doing what's right and good. That you'll thwart those who are doing what is evil and hurting others and should not be. We pray that you will guide the leaders of all different nations and situations uh, addressing this complex situation going on, that your good will will be done. We thank you, Lord, for the blessing of little Savannah James Switch, which is the new granddaughter of Jim and Liz Lively, who was born on October 27th. Bless and be with her and her family in this new stage of life now to be having the next generation there. We pray, Lord, thanks to you that you kept watch over Carol Costner and her recovery from her surgery and let her come home this past week. Continue to strengthen and be with her. We pray that you will bless the Christmas craft sale going on by our ladies this week here with the community coming in. Bless the interactions with us as your people together with those who are coming, some of who do not know you, do not have faith in you. It will be an opportunity for us to bear witness to your goodness and to encourage them to consider those things as well. So we pray for these things then, all is in our hearts, in the name of Jesus. He has taught us to pray together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We remember in the Lord's Supper the gift he has given to us of his very body and blood for that forgiveness of sins and encouragement to walk with him faithfully and a reminder that it's not just God and us one of one, it's God and us and each other as the body of Christ, the church. So we remember then together that our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night that he was betrayed, took bread when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said to them, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the same way also, Jesus took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this cup is New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So please have a seat, if you will, and let's celebrate the Lord's Supper together. All throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storms made way for spring. In every season from where
Now may boast his precious body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and keep each of you steadfast in that faith he's given you till the day <clears throat> he says your work on earth is done and he takes you home to be with him in life everlasting in heaven. Depart in his peace and his consistent mercy. Amen. All right, this is the day the Lord has made. So let us rejoice in it and make it count for him. May he bless and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he be gracious upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Thank you for being here. God bless the rest of your day. And enjoy that sunshine out there. And hopefully not get too dark tonight with the time change. We'll see you next Sunday. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us. church we need your power in us and we seek your kingdom first we hunger and we thirst refuse to waste our lives for your our joy and prize to see the captive hearts released the hurt the sick the poor Junk!